This is the last formal session of the LSE Law, Law, Technology and Society program for this academic year. Uh, we'll be picking up again at the start of next academic year. Um, and, and we're ending on a, on a high note. Um, some of you will know that, that we've benefited from uh, uh, earlier lectures from Professor Jeremiah Adams Prassel of Oxford University, who talked about the AI Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, a regulation of the European Union, proposed regulation, um, in the context of employment and artificial intelligence in the workplace. Uh, and he made some uh, very interesting points about the legal basis for the Artificial Intelligence Act. Last night, we were very glad to have uh, Dr. Emmanuel Kahanwe, I'll introduce in a moment, who talked about foundation data um, and uh, problems with sets, data sets that are used in, in searches. And I'm sorry, Manny, if I've, if I've glossed over that. Um, and tonight we're going to hear about the role of standards in the context of the Artificial Intelligence Act. Um, and as uh, Dr. Sebastian Hallensleben explained to me before, um, how the role of standards will actually make the Artificial Intelligence Act work. Um, some of that is clearly about future working and, and, and what I'm hoping we're going to hear is some of the thinking that went into the approach to this legislation. The legislation itself probably needs not much introduction. Um, it is the biggest news in formal regulation of artificial intelligence globally. Um, that is because it is comprehensive. Uh, it has been worked on for, for several years at various levels within European Union. Um, and it purports to, uh, to do, well, it's designed to do two things. One is to regulate um, artificial intelligence, building trust and confidence in so doing. But at the same time, um, it, it, it looks to creating a, a large, vibrant single market within the European Union for the deployment of artificial intelligence. Uh, and so it, it is the only major piece of regulation anywhere in the world, compounded by the fact that, of course, um, anything that the European Union produces as a regulation will be implemented, will, will apply directly within the whole block of the European Union, and in some cases, the European economic area as well, to be, to be seen. Um, and some of you will know as well that the Artificial Intelligence Act has an uh, extraterritorial effect. Ooh. So rather like GDPR, although well, one doesn't want to push the, uh, the comparisons too far, uh, those third country organizations within the supply chain of, art of artificial intelligence uh, who uh, wish to uh, 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 make available artificial intelligence in the European Union market will have to comply with a serious set of rules. So in effect, uh, that, that extends the territoriality of the uh, proposed regulation to those organizations outside. Um, and then of course, there is the Brussels effect, you know, and, and, and overall, um, what the European Union expects is that the European Union itself will become the central market for artificial intelligence uh, in, in the coming years. Uh, as I understand it, the proposed uh, Artificial Intelligence Act is still uh, going through a series of um, discussions. Uh, there is still, I think, quite intensive lobbying going on among various interest groups um, to promote uh, various ideas. There are concerns about um, too many uh, uh, exemptions in the areas of national security and uh, criminal law enforcement and so on. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to hear now from uh, our two uh, distinguished guests. Firstly, Dr. Sebastian Hallensleben, no. uh, who is head of digitalization of AI at VDE. No, 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 no. Sorry, in, terms, in, in, order of, in order of speaking, yes. um, Dr. Emmanuel Kahemwe, who is uh, 
Chief Executive Officer of VDE UK and Ireland. So um, as you're going first, Manny, if I may call you that, um, please do explain what VDE does. Um, what I've learned is that it's a very powerful organization, very influential um, in, in Europe, but it's perhaps less well known in the UK. And I know that part of your role is to make us better educated about VDE. Um, and uh, you uh, have were recently awarded two doctorates, one from the University of Edinburgh, another from the Harriet Watt University, both uh, in artificial intelligence, robotics, and autonomous systems, although I imagine each is somewhat differently flavored. Um, and you are also currently um, in within digital sovereignty working group of CEN, CEN, and CENELEC. Um, our next speaker will be Dr. Sebastian Hallensleben, who is head of digitalization and AI at VDE. Um, I, I do urge you to go on, go on to LinkedIn to, 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 to get the full stories behind Emmanuel and Sebastian. Um, a, a short summary uh, of, of uh, Dr. Hallensleben's career so far. Um, he's also chair joint technical committee 21 Artificial Intelligence at CEN, CEN, and CENELEC. Um, he's on the European Commission Stand ICT Expert Advisory Group and Chair of the TWG Trusted Information Grouping. Uh, he is co-chair of OECD-1 AI Classification Risk Assessment, um, and, and so his roles continue. Um, he has a very distinguished academic career, uh, having uh, amongst others, a doctorate from the University of Sussex in physics, having attended the University of Würzburg, uh, and um, I think having a first degree from the University of Tübingen. Um, so if I may now hand over to uh, um, Emmanuel and to uh, Sebastian. When is time next to the microphone? Or? All right, so uh, for those who are uh, here yesterday, we got to cover some a gross overview of kind of like what the AI ecosystem looks like from a practitioner's point of view, uh, what's involved in actually deploying uh, our AI project into the real world. And there were many questions afterwards, uh, both to do with the issues around that were obvious from this process, but also, I guess, uh, how to bring this in, uh, as in how do we actually formalize this into something that we can trust and use in everyday life. And thus, this leads to this talk that we're having today, which is that process, uh, in a sense. And in order to, I guess, my job today, I had my moment of fame yesterday, is to kind of sit around and uh, get people in thinking, uh, first of all, what is sterilization? How does it relate to regulation? And what does that mean for the AI Act? Uh, to start with that is classical case, a washing machine. Everyone has one. Uh, I assume most people trust them. Uh, since this is a small group here in person, I'm going to be bringing people, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, bringing an audience. In a sense that, uh, first question, when you buy a washing machine, what do you look for? Energy what do you look for in a, in a washing machine when you buy one? Efficiency. Efficiency, that's exactly Efficiency in what, in what, term, in, in what, in what sense? Energy efficiency. Okay, there's energy efficiency. Okay. Any other type of efficiency? Performance. Yes, there's performance efficiency, and that's everything from how long it takes to, uh, I guess, uh, wash your clothes and how, how good a job it does. Interestingly, most, when most people think about this washing machine, they don't think about uh, the number of, I guess, the regulations and standards that surround such a piece of equipment uh, that's inside your house. You trust that you're going to buy it, it's not going to burn down your house. It's no, you've got something that's spinning at a very high RPM. You know, it's like almost like having a small little jet engine in your in your house, and everyone has one, and they trust that it works correctly. It's got thousands of components in it, not necessarily from the same manufacturer, uh, and we can still trust that uh, 
it operates as expected. At least uh, if you buy one a washing machine and it breaks the next day, like something is wrong because that is unexpected behavior. And so I guess uh, I use this example here because it's a standard piece of equipment that I assume everyone and like uses every day. Uh, and AI is going to be like that. And in this sense, I can kind of relate where we want to end up from where we are right now. So uh, I was recently at the VD offices in uh, Offenbach, where we actually went to the testing institutes to uh, test uh, such machines. Uh, whenever you buy one, they have all been tested uh, at an institute such as ours, which I believe is one of the largest in the world. Um, and apart from when you, when you think about things like performance and energy efficiency and you expect it to and you get the nice little ratings on the side in a readable form what backs that is for example one of the tests that, that are done for this machine is you have a standard piece of dirty towel like uh, there's a standardized dirty towel with, <coughs> with types of dirt on it there's a, this, this is a business for an entire company um, and we get that piece of dirty towel and we put it in the washing machine in a particular orientation, delivered from some manufacturer. Like every, 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 every washing machine has to go through this process. And we put it through a cycle for a set amount of time. Uh, we keep pretty much everything the same, as in we, call, we control for uh, the type of water because water changes depending on which region of the world you're in. So there's actually a machine that uh, simulates the water compositions from different parts of the world so that you make sure that the machine can work, the washing machine can actually work uh, to all the environments it's deployed in. And then after the cycle is done, uh, after a pre-allocated amount of time, you take that towel out and you put it under another machine that actually grades how well it's done this job or washing. This is your performance test, all right? And so when you, at the end, when, company like BDE certifies it for a certain level of performance. This is the minimum criteria. I guess at the end of what the, the minimum criteria that, that you, you assume that there's a minimum criteria of testing and quality control that has gone into this process. Not to mention that the individual pieces in here are already tested. They're already, they're already certified for operating under particular loads of electrical loads. Um, and the interesting thing is that even with all the individual components tested and certified, the whole still has to be tested and certified within what we assume is going to be the operational domain, as I call it, the environment in which it's going to operate. And so uh, one of the interesting things that uh, <laughs> I guess uh, uh, was raised up by one of the testing engineers was that uh, when liquid detergent came along is that the, the fact that you could, most people put this on top of the washing machine and it spills required the testing spec to change to accommodate for that. So now that's also something that's included in a test. It's a bit reactionary in the sense that we didn't expect this to begin with, but this happened enough times that uh, testing criteria and the standards around this evolved to match uh, the, the real world. So that's your washing, washing machine. Safety, we check for that. Reliability, we check for that. We have guarantees on that, we have metrics on that. And in the end, that this alludes the main reason you trust your washing machine to do the job it does. And I, I guess one of the things I even, uh, I, I forgot to bring up is that even how loud your machine is, is tested. And we put it into uh, one of these soundproof rooms with microphones all around because your machine's gonna be on for several hours a day. You know, several times a week. So we need to also test for that because that's also can be categorized probably as a health or a safety issue. All right. And again, hitting on the point that, uh, which is something that you'll keep on seeing in the AI world is that we tested one bit, so it works and, you know, but uh, even in this case of a machine where we can say we understand all the components completely in some way, you can build nice models of it and how it should operate, uh, we still test the whole machine even after putting guarantees on the individual components. And that's why if you scale this up to more complicated systems, this is why you trust plane you fly in. 
All right. So what are the goals of standardization? The first thing is to make sure we have a common language. Uh, and legislation tries to do the same thing, but standardization kind of formalizes it as we sit there and we debate on the terminology that everyone's going to be speaking. Since uh, at the end, when you create a standard and people have to test that standard, and to achieve that standard, it has to be the same no matter where in the world you are. Um, so a common language is defined. The other thing that uh, standards allow for is uh, they actually help with the uh, traction and market adoption. Once a standard is created, uh, people at least can go and see what criteria uh, piece of equipment or software that meets that standard has, is supposed to meet. Um, and in general, uh, if you have a product that's uh, certified as meeting a standard, it's a little bit more trustworthy than one that's not. In most cases, most of, much more trustworthy than the one that's not, especially in the software case. And that will help in, if you go to a consumer, uh, even though you might pretend that they do not notice these things, uh, I think between if you're comparing, uh, comparing products, it does matter. You have symbols of trust. And those trust symbols, uh, and the reason, again, the reason why you, you, you gain uh, traction as a company or any organization is that uh, you have this assurance, assurance of quality and safety and trust that the product you have will operate as expected. The other thing, the other goal of standardization is conformity and support of regulations and policy. Uh, uh, there's uh, sometimes the standards preempt the regulations, sometimes the regulations, you know, start the process for standardization, standardization but the two come hand in hand. And also they help agree on what is good practice, um, especially in the case where standards start to preempt legislation. So the big thing that uh, I guess uh, you're gonna get from Sebastian's talk now is what should this look like for AI? Uh, uh, we'd hope that uh, you can trust your AI algorithm as much as you can trust your washing machine. Uh, right. <laughs> I'll leave it on that note, Sebastian. I should change over the slides. So for those of you who will be a slight section where we hand over the different slides here. Actually, while, while you do that, um, I, can, I can do a little interlude on what those uh, letters we actually mean at the bottom. Um, so as, as uh, we heard in the introduction, uh, it's, it's a fairly large organization. Uh, it exists uh, in many different countries, but it's not very well known. It's actually an old organization, um, 130 years old. And uh, it started at a time when electricity was the new, the dangerous, but also the exciting and promising technology. And at the time, there were lots of accidents. There was a lot of jostling in the market with different companies trying to push their ways of um, implementing electricity, DC versus AC, different voltage levels, and plugs and sockets didn't fit together They were from different manufacturers. And there was a real danger that the adoption of electricity, and the broad, broad of electricity didn't happen for commercial reasons, but also because society at some point says, well, now let's go back to, to uh, those old gas lights. Uh, they're a bit dirty, but uh, they're more reliable and it's, it's the devil you know. And uh, in this context, a bunch of electrical engineers came together uh, in, in, in Berlin, uh, led by Werner von Siemens, and uh, they created a new to develop the initial set of standards for electrical safety and also for interoperability of electrical components. And uh, that organization exists to this day, creating standards, but also uh, testing against standards, as, as Manny explained, um, ranging from washing machines all the way to cables to uh, electrical components, um, but also to uh, uh, software items with, with, uh, with the cybersecurity issues, um, uh, testing against health standards and so on. Okay, so thanks again for the, for the uh, introduction and also for the jump off point towards uh, how does this all work for AI and um, what's the role of the AI act in that. I've put 
a long list of affiliations on, onto this first slide, not, not to show off, but to demonstrate how many different moving parts there are um, at the European level, at the supranational level, that make AI regulation, standardization, and governance happen. And I also expanded a little bit on the uh, title of the, of the seminar. I think it was advertised as drafting the EU AI Act. I'm actually not going to talk that much about the drafting of the AI Act itself, because that has been uh, presented by European Commission officials in quite a few events already, but more around the context that is needed for the AI Act to function, or for a complex piece of regulation like the AI Act to function. So let's wind back a number of years. What were the initial thoughts, processes that led to the AI Act? It's been around for a while, um, that statement, well, Europe has to take a third way of AI. Not quite the Chinese way, not, not AI for full control of everything in the country, and also not quite the US way, AI driven mainly by, by uh, commercial motives, but something that is sort of European. And there were two aspects to it. First of all, protecting the interests of Europe with respect to rights, values, and principles, and also to protect European citizens and promote European industry. And these two parts of the discussion have been reflected almost from the start in all the actions that the European Commission took to start to prepare the drafting process. Most notably in the high level expert group that worked 2017 and 2018 and uh, came up with a number of pretty good, very readable reports that uh, actually split into those parts. Okay, so what, what does AI need to do to protect European fundamental values? And what does AI need to do to protect the interests of European industry and also to promote innovation at the European level? So <clears throat> the question is, what are actually the specificities? What is, what is special around the European situation and hence about the European approach to AI. And I'd, I'd like to, to highlight four um, aspects, um, some obvious, some maybe a little bit more surprising. So a fairly obvious one is ethics and trustworthiness of AI. Um, everyone in the world agrees around transparency, fa transparency, fairness, privacy being important, but very few people understand how to operationalize and how to enforce things like transparency and measure and, and privacy. How do you even measure transparency? And hence, how can you enforce it? And that desire not just to have nice words uh, on a company website saying, oh, our AI is transparent and it uh, protects privacy, but rather having metrics to measure it and to, to enforce certain um, standards on it. That, that is a um, European specificity. The next item um, I'm calling data efficiency. Companies both in China and in the US are spoiled for data because they've been accustomed to just, just milking anything that happens online and anything that people do online for vast amounts of data. And therefore, it's easy for them to train AI with vast amounts of data. In Europe, we don't do that. And we're, we're sort of proud that we're not collecting every available um, bit of data. But it also means that we need to look at a broader spectrum of AI methods, methods that work without needing such vast amounts of data. And that not only helps in uh, consumer-focused applications of AI, it also helps in certain industrial applications. So imagine you want to train an AI system to spot the early warning signs of a chemical factory blowing up. You can't really let a thousand factories blow up to collect enough data uh, to train your AI system to, 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 to spot the early warning signs. You, you need a different way. You need to be more creative. And so that, um, if you like, artificial 
uh, dearth of data in Europe uh, is actually a, a promoter of uh, innovation as far as AI is, AI is concerned. Next, obviously data protection, um, but also uh, data jurisdiction. And we do have a jurisdictional issue um, with data already and with AI as well. I'm not going to dive into that because that's been discussed a lot. But also, um, and this again refers back to the availability of data, we don't have in Europe the huge corporations that have everything under, under one roof, collecting the data, analyzing it, creating algorithms, training algorithms, having the applications to roll out AI applications. A company like Facebook or Microsoft or Google has it all under one roof. We do not have such huge corporations in Europe. We might have one company that has the data, another company that can analyze it, a third company that can train an algorithm and so on. And we don't want to merge everything together in Europe to, to create that behemoth uh, company. So if those puzzle pieces come from different um, directions, they need to fit together. So we need to work a lot harder on the right interfaces and the right standards to make sure that those puzzle pieces and those data sets can come together. So, as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to rehash the whole AI Act. Uh, I'm, I'm not a legal specialist. Um, and also this has been presented quite a few times before. Uh, just as a, as a reminder, I'd quite like to highlight two of the um, key principles that the European Commission has chosen to follow in drafting the Act. Um, one of them is that they very wisely didn't attempt to regulate the technology, which is wise because it's not even possible to clearly define what AI is, but they chose to regulate the application of the technology. And secondly, um, they chose to uh, implement a risk-based approach, so not to have the same um, type of uh, regulation for all applications of AI, but um, graded by, by risk. And that picture is from uh, an, an EU presentation of this. But if you do look into the AI Act, um, it doesn't go into that much more detail. It is, yes, it sort of explains in a few sentences what each of those um, risk levels do, but that's not nearly enough for practical purposes. So it's, it outlines the overall policy objectives, but all the operationalization is uh, left to other parties. So, for example, we might want or need details on more detailed, more fine-grained rules of which application fits in, into which risk categories uh, under, under which circumstances. We might need some rules and input on how this risk pyramid fits together with existing risk management, management frameworks, for example, in the health and safety world um, or in, uh, in, in um, medical devices, and where, where risk management and risk mitigation have a long tradition, and there's a lot that has been written and standardized around it. We'll also need procedures and responsibilities for conformity assessment. Again, the AI Act has a few sentences on those, but it's not particularly detailed at all. And we also um, need some more practical details. So maybe tools to implement those, those mapping rules, tools for testing. Um, we might also need collections of best practice uh, guidance on how to achieve um, maybe a informed AI and also how to structure an organization so that development processes result in good AI, whatever good is in a given context. So the question is, who does this? Who, who picks up after the lawmakers finish and have gone home, so to speak? The answer has got multiple parts. So I'd like to start with the more practical um, details that need to, be, need to be filled in. And there's actually a mix of actors involved here. There's private sector companies, there's multinational organizations, there's, there's NGOs that can all work very freely and without any, any obvious coordination on, on, on such issues. 
Um, a few examples here. Uh, OECD is one, uh, IEEE is a, is a very well known one and very active and has been active in AI <coughs> ethics and trustworthiness for, for a number of years. Um, Big Data Value Association, Gaia X, um, they don't call themselves a standardization organization, but they uh, create standard IT architecture definitions. And uh, it's, it's everything, it's, it is standardization except, except in name. Um, and also, interesting for you, uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether anyone here has been looking into that already. The uh, Council of Europe, so not, not to be confused with the European Council, the Council of Europe with 47 members, maybe 46 if they kick out Russia, um, has an AI working group that is very heavy on the... It is very heavy on the uh, uh, legal side and also very uh, thorough in its analysis and it's very well worth a read. Um, and uh, given that there are so many countries in such a diverse range of countries involved there, it's the, the, the output there is very, very impressive. So I can, I can only recommend that. Okay, so that's, that's just some of the, the universe of companies that work on, on detailing um, the AI Act. As we go to the more formal, more kind of regulation-like details that need to be filled in, we're getting to a very specific set of organizations, the uh, European standardization organizations. Three organizations, I'll show them on the next slide. And um, they have a special relationship with the European Union. And they, and only they, are allowed to create so-called harmonized standards. And a harmonized standard is a standard that is published alongside the regulation. So it almost is like regulation, but it is produced in a completely different way. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So I said three, three organizations. Um, you see them in the middle tier. European organizations that are allowed to produce European standards at SEN, Senenec, and Etsy. And they are connected to the European Union through the so called new legislative framework. This is actually a lie. Um, this goes back to the 1980s, um, so called the new legislative framework. And uh, I'll get into a few of the details in a moment. And uh, you see three columns there. So uh, you have a Kind of general standardization topics, we have electrotechnical topics, and we have uh, telecommunications topics. There are historical reasons for having those three columns, but they go all the way to the international level as well. Um, you'll be familiar with uh, ISO, IEC, and ITU, and they are the international correspondent organizations to SEN, SEN, and ETSI. And at the national level, uh, you have those uh, organizations as well. In Germany, we have uh, DIN and uh, DKE, which is the standardization part of VDE. And um, in, in the UK, you've got ESI that covers the whole national level. Uh, in France, it's AFNOR. Um, and depending on the country, you might have one, two, or three organizations covering the national side. So the AI committees are typically not associated with one of the three columns. And that's because it's not obvious where they fit. Is AI an electrotechnical issue? Or is it an IT issue? Or is it safety issue or risk management issue? It has a little bit of both. And to stop wrangling between the organizations on who gets the AI group because it's all really sexy and attracts lots of expert and lots of, lots of publicity. Um, most of the organizations decided to form joint committees. And so you have, you have the um, joint committee one, subcommittee 42 at the international level, um, formed by ISO and OIC. And at the European level, it's the um, JTC 21, which um, I'm sharing. And uh, we also have a very tight integration with uh, Etsy. Okay, so new legislative framework. As I said, it goes back to the 80s and in its current incarnations, if you browse through the uh, 
year numbers that, that, that are in the text here, it's about 10, 15 years old. So it's, this is actually a slide that I lifted from a uh, presentation by the um, European Commission by Salvatore Scalzo, who is their AI coordinator. Um, so this is top up to date and uh, from, the, from, from the source. Um, but I'm also not going to go too deep into it. But what you can see is that this framework consists of a number of individual pieces of regulation that together form the special relationship between the European Union and the European standardization organizations. And um, what does it contain? First of all, um, it contains the process under which the European Commission formulates essential requirements to say, yep, this is really, really important for us. This is what uh, standards need to describe to underpin the AI Act. Um, it contains the processes for creating harmonized standards. It contains the division of responsibilities. Um, so what are the roles of manufacturers with importers, distributors, and also um, it contains conformity assessment procedures, and most importantly, not all, it contains a conf presumption of conformity. So if the manufacturer of an AI product can show that their product follows the applicable harmonized standards, there's a, there's a presumption of conformity to the regulation, and there is also a presumption of not being liable if something goes wrong. So if and this doesn't, doesn't just apply to AI, it applies to the washing machine or to other products as well. If a manufacturer doesn't follow the standards, in many cases they can do that because standards are still voluntary. But if the washing machine behaves erratically, if it burns down the house, the manufacturer has to prove that it was not the washing machine's fault. Whereas if the manufacturer does follow all the applicable standards for washing machines and the house burns down, then the owner of the house or the insurance company has to prove that the washing machine was at fault. So that's a very, very powerful incentive to um, uh, conform to standards. Okay, so <clears throat> I'd like to drill a little bit deeper into what's actually happening inside such a standardization group. And, uh, since I'm chairing JTC21, I, I pick on it as an example, but uh, the processes are quite similar in, in other similar groups as well. So <clears throat> first of all, the standardization committee has got a scope. And that scope is a statement that is being fought over tooth and nail um, in, in and around the uh, kickoff session of such a committee. So it reads quite harmless, but uh, it's a result of a lot of wrangling between different interests, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit later. But uh, so it says, create standardization deliverables for AI, so those could be standards or technical reports, and it's use of related data. It says, consider the adoption of international standards relevant to Europe. And this is very, very carefully crafted as a statement. There is no point in reinventing the wheel at the European level. Um, if a standard for AI for a certain aspect of AI already exists or is being developed at the international level and it fits the European needs. Oh, great. Um, European uh, Committee might kind of stick a European number on it, uh, might even kind of elevate it to the status of a harmonized standard and be done with it. So, yeah, fine, an afternoon's work and uh, we'll have a whole new standard for Europe. Fine. In other cases, International standards might not exist at all, or they might exist, but not quite fit European needs or the European situation, <coughs> in which case um, they, they are being modified um, uh, to, to serve European needs. And finally, the final, final uh, bubble there is, is really um, the reaffirmation that just like regulation, uh, standardization, standardization of AI is supposed to address European market and societal needs and underpin European legislation, policies, principles, and values. And even that last sentence was to our discussion at the kickoff meeting. Ah, should their values, should values be in there? 
where standardizers, what we're talking about values, and this is going too far. So long, long discussions in, in various ways. You can see from the number of countries that are participating just how uh, seriously um, people take their eyes. It's very unusual for a standardization committee at the European level to have that many participants from that many countries. Um, normally, it might be half a dozen countries or so. Typically, those that are leading from an engineering perspective in a given technology that has been standardized. Also, um, at JTC21 has an unusually large number of interfaces to the outside world. Um, of course, the standardization committee related activities happen in other groups uh, in Europe and internationally, but also a very strong interface to the uh, European Commission. Um, in a typical meeting, we might have 100 people from the standardization world, but also easily 10 people from the European Commission from the various directorates, uh, DG Just, DG Connect, DG Grow, the Joint Research Center, um, DG Santé. Um, and it just underlines how seriously the European Commission takes the role of standardization um, in supporting their AI Act. There's also a slightly mysterious um, term on here, um, Annex Three organizations, which sounds a little bit like a secret society. Um, this is actually um, the hallmark of standardization, but it's not just companies coming together and agreeing on technical standards. Standardization is supposed to bring together all relevant stakeholders, whatever relevant means in a given, in a given situation. So it could be consumer organizations, it could be small businesses, it could be trade unions, it could be uh, organizations promoting environmental sustainability. And Annex 3 actually lists um, a, a handful of organizations in Europe, including, for example, Annex for, for consumer um, uh, issues that have a sort of automatic role or kind of a special role within standardization. But the secretary and the chair of the standardization committee has a duty to reach out as far as possible. If, if we think as a, as, a, as a management team that, um, I don't know, J J J Japanese uh, uh, whaling uh, organizations are relevant for a given standard, we have to reach out to them and at least ask them, do you want to come in and contribute? Okay, so I'm now going to build a picture that looks extremely messy at the end, uh, but I'm going to build it step by step um, and hopefully it'll become clear, it'll become uh, an insight for you into well, how does such a group actually decide what to do? Because you've got a bunch of other people in, in the room from 20 countries, uh, from maybe 40, 50, 60 different organizations, some small, some large, some very kind of profit-driven industrial, uh, some more on, a, on, a, on, a, on an NGO perspective. How do you actually get those hundred people to decide on what to standardize in the first place. And how do we do it in a way that it makes the um, European Union happy and uh, supports the AI Act as well? So <clears throat> there's actually, first of all, a route mapping process. SAG stands for um, Strategic Advisory Group, sort of the chair advisory group of, of JTC21. And uh, it is a top down review of European standardization needs. So uh, it, it looks at uh, previous work in the standardization, standardization world, the draft of the Act, any standardization requests issued by the European Union, and so on. And it also does a top-down review. What, what do we already have um, that might satisfy those standardization needs at the international level, at IEEE, in Europe, elsewhere? And uh, presumably there's a gap in that top-down analysis. And that gives an initial hint on potential activities that uh, JTC 21 should consider. This is not a one-off process, but something that um, repeats again and again over time. So that's a top-down approach. But there's also a bottom-up approach. So you've got all the national committees in individual countries 
looking at, uh, well, what do they think needs to be standardized for AI. You've got uh, people coming together in ad hoc groups to consider certain standardization topics. And typically each of those is very much focused on one particular need. Um, so for example, let's say green AI. Um, so again, they look oh, there's a need, what existing work do we have? And if there's a gap, that might be another potential change to 21 activity. And again, this is something that's more or less an ongoing process. So somehow these potential activities need to be merged or considered together to form the so-called new work item proposals. So someone, um, again, it's quite tightly regulated uh, who, who's got that, that right, um, proposes a new work item, there's a special form for that, and it's supposed to take into account both relevant pieces from the bottom-up um, work and the top-down work. It goes to a, to a ballot, eight to 10, 12 week ballot, uh, amongst all the national bodies. And then the work item can start as technical report, technical specification, or a harmonized standard. So the ES stands for harmonized standard. And again, that repeats over time, um, kicking off more and more items. Okay, and uh, to stop it being so completely abstract and theoretical, this is the list of current bottom-up activities um, that uh, are being worked on in JTC 21. Um, and uh, I'd like to briefly walk through them to just give you a flavor of what is actually happening there. So augmented goal specification refers to a very thorny issue. People say you can't express ethics as a math mathematical formula. Most people will agree, yes, yeah, that would be horrible if we, could, if we had a formula for ethics. No, 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 let's not go there. But if you train an AI system and you want to tell the AI system, well, this is the way, the ideal way to behave, and the idea, you need to express that ideal behavior in a mathematical way, otherwise you can't do the training. But what if that ideal behavior contains certain ethical issues as well? All of a sudden, you have to express your ethical goals, objectives in a math mathematical way. And this um, ad hoc group uh, on the better goals specification looks at ways to resolve that, that uh, apparent conflict. Next one is on AI conformity assessment. So, this is around um, defining ways how uh, an AI system or an AI application should be um, tested. Green and sustainable AI, I already mentioned, a very big issue, um, also with, with questions around, well, how do you take into account uh, the huge energy effort during training AI, um, as opposed to during using it AI, how do you take into account whether it was dirty or clean energy, and so on. Speech recognition is a special European concern because we do have many languages, data governance, um, the uh, quality is a European concern and also um, nudging. So this has to do with how far can AI go in influencing, subtly influencing the behavior of people. Um, the value judgment on this obviously comes from regulators. That's not the role of standardization, but how do you even describe what nudging is? And how do you define what's happening there? Um, that is something that needs to happen on the standard side. Ethics and trustworthiness, I'll, I'll get to in a moment, and also risk categories and risk management. So, <clears throat> looking at ethics and trustworthiness, since it's been discussed so much, um, how do you handle AI ethics for standardization? It doesn't seem particularly intuitive in how to do that. That's one way that doesn't work. Um, and that's to express explicit ethical rules. So child's more important than an older person or vice versa, or it's better to have 100 injured um, rather than one dead or vice versa. And uh, most of you will be aware of uh, little experiments like the moral machine from the, by the University of Michigan that has shown quite nicely that there's no consensus and that, that there are huge cultural differences. And that's not something that standardization 
should, should, should even consider because that, that's not what you, what you can achieve there. Fine, it's easy to say that's not what we do. You could go to the other extreme. You could say, well, let's, let's leave the whole, um, the actual ethical dynamics out of it, and we only standardize the processes and the uh, structures that are being used to make um, AI ethics decisions. That's an approach that is, for example, being used for um, quality. So you're familiar with the ISO 9001. Companies love saying that they are ISO 9001 certified. Um, ISO 9001 doesn't say what quality is. It just says, follow this process, create this documentation, set up these structures, and, we, and if you can prove that, you're ISO 9001 certified, and we assume that this leads to quality in, in, in your products. That's an approach we could use for AI ethics, and we kind of work around all these kind of messy dynamics here. It's got two disadvantages. One, it means that hard, sensitive, ethical decisions are taken inside organizations where they're not open to societal discourse. And uh, two, well, if I'm a large company with profit as the uh, top priority, I might just employ another one or two people in the compliance department to produce a bit more documentation. And it's very, very hard to enforce from outside um, if um, companies aren't acting in good faith. So it has limitations. But the ISO, uh, sorry, the IEEE P7, P7000 series is very much on in, in that camp. And it's more like a best practice guide to companies that do like to do the right thing and don't quite know how. So for obvious reasons, I've left a slot in the middle. And this is uh, what uh, I've been working towards um, in a number of standardization uh, groups and an approach that is now taking hold, fortunately. And that's sort of a best of both worlds approach. You all know the energy efficiency label, even came up earlier in the context of the washing machines. Um, the energy efficiency label doesn't say, oh, this is um, acceptable or not acceptable. It also doesn't even say that strongly whether something is good or bad. <laughs> is it's a standardized way of describing characteristics of the machine. So you might end up with an energy class B. And then you, as a consumer, can make a decision, well, I'll take the cheap machine with class B or the more expensive machine with class A. And even as a regulator, you can use cutoffs. So for example, when um, incandescent bulbs were outlawed um, in the European Union a number of years ago. They weren't outlawed by saying, oh, we can't sell incandescent bulbs anymore. They were outlawed by saying, well, you can't sell any bulbs anymore with an energy efficiency rating worse than um, E or D, something like that. And incandescent bulbs just about landed on the wrong side of that cutoff. So you had an energy efficiency level already in existence with all the measurement standards and all the metrics around it to put it into practice. The market knew it, the consumers knew it, and regulators could just build on it and more or less with one sentence, well, I'm sure it was a bit more, but in principle as well with one sentence, um, a outlaw um, incandescent bulbs. So for the ethical aspects of AI systems, we can use a very similar approach, except that we don't just have one scale from A to G, but we have maybe five or six. Um, so you could have one for well, how transparent is the system, how accountable, um, what's the privacy protection like, how fair is it, what justice criteria, how reliable is it. And you could even, if you like, also have a rating for environmental sustainability. There is no point aggregating further because, for example, transparency and privacy tend to be, to some extent, mutually exclusive. Um, and you don't really want to prejudge which is more appropriate in the given context. 
And so uh, that's that's the level of aggregation that you should get to. Um, and so that, that's a debate for um, capturing um, AI ethics through standards and to make it measurable. I'll, I'll skip the whole world of questions there. Um, and I'd like to end by highlighting a few of the difficulties and controversies around standardization. First of all, legitimacy. The AI Act itself, the regulation, takes its legitimacy from the democratic processes within the European Union, either directly through the involvement of the European Party Parliament or indirectly through the national governments. What is it for standards? Standards are so important, and in the case of harmonized standards, almost like regulation, where do they take their legitimacy from? The easy answer is, ah, it's standardization brings together all relevant stakeholders, and uh, it's a consensus-driven process. It really works very, very hard to achieve um, consensus, even if it takes years. So it's fine, but that is some degree of legitimacy. True. In practice, the issue is, well, who's actually got the time and the budget to contribute to such groups? It's not the startup that had consists of three people, all of which are doing seven jobs um, day and night. It's not going to be the little NGO, also consisting of three people doing seven jobs day and night. It tends to be very large organizations, large industrial companies um, and other well-equipped organizations. So that consensus is to some, ex to some extent skewed. And you could ask the question, well, how legitimate is it? Second issue, European sovereignty. If you look at the list of affiliations of uh, participants in JTC21, Microsoft, it's Huawei, it's IBM, it's Google, um, there's Amazon. You could ask the question, well, what business do those global companies have in deciding how Europe handles AI? Yes, they say, well, we, we obviously do business in, in Europe. We, we kind of deal with, we affect European consumers, so we should have a say. But um, yeah, you could, you could ask the question whether um, that is maybe counter to the idea of having European sovereignty. And on top of that, uh, in the case of Huawei, we have the whole debate around um, standardization as a geopolitical instrument. Um, China has started to, well, it started maybe 10, 15 years ago to be much more active and much more strategic in uh, contributing to standardization committees and to try and influence standardization uh, according to their own national interests. So that there's a that's a fault line there as well. And generally, standardization is driven by whoever understands the technology. If you have a country without AI engineers or AI programmers, that country is not going to send people into standardization groups. So in a sense, it might still be affected by AI standards, but it's not going to shape them. So that again is also a bit of an issue. And in fact, the um, standardization strategy, the overall standardization strategy that the European Commission, like Thierry Breton, presented at the beginning of February, um, put a lot of focus on European sovereignty in that context. And that leads on to the next quandary, what is Europe? The scope is surprisingly hard to define, and that's harsh for engineers working in standardization groups because they usually like kicking off their work on a new topic by defining the terminology. So what is what is a machine, what is AI, what is machine learning, what is, and so on. But if they talk about European specificities, they have to define what is Europe. And that's not clear for a AI system. You might have um, the servers sitting in a data center in Germany that's run by a French company. 
The training data comes from murky sources in China. Um, the algorithm was developed in Silicon Valley, and uh, the training happened by um, a company in Norway, say. And so you have five, six, seven jurisdictions that are somehow touching that AI system. And how do you actually say this is a European AI system or not a European AI system? And how do you deal with competing jurisdictions of, of that system? We have the exact same problem already for data and the uh, failure of the safe harbor um, approach and the, the uh, privacy shield approach have highlighted that we simply haven't got on top of that boundary yet with overlapping jurisdictions. And for AI, it's even worse. So that needs a lot of work. And uh, Manny is in one of the groups that uh, tries to uh, find, find ways of, of attacking that issue. And finally, um, obstruction and circumvention by monopolists. I mentioned earlier that standardization takes its legitimacy from being consensus driven. So that means someone with a bit of resources and, and time who doesn't want standards to exist for a given topic has got a lot of scope for um, putting the brakes on the standardization process to hold it, hold it up, to, to kind of draw it out for forever. And uh, we've, we've seen it, for example, with uh, Office standards, uh, Office document standards where, where Microsoft have dragged out the standardization process for many, many, many years. Um, and we see it in AI as well, that there are some market leaders that simply don't believe that our standards in their interest and therefore have, a, have an incentive, let's put it that way, um, to um, obstruct or circumvent the standardization process. And with these open questions, boundaries, maybe also kind of critical notes on standardization, I'd like to conclude um, my talk, and uh, I think we've still got, hopefully, got time for plenty of questions. Yeah. Uh, Manny and Sebastian, thank you so much for fascinating talk. Um, it's not often that we have the opportunity to hear from the inside out um, and from bottom up and top down about how such seminal European legislation is actually influenced and then legislated for. So I'd like those in the room, those at home, if you'd like to, please. Um, to wonderful talk. Um, Andrew, I think you're going to be Coordinating any questions yeah. on Zoom? But I we do. We have a few questions on Zoom now. Now this is set up as a webinar, so I think even if we get rid of the slides, we won't see the people um, who are on Zoom. But can we, I take off the yeah, you can. Do. Thank the you. The slides, you. perhaps. Uh, you. But I don't think I don't think we'll see the people anyway. I think we'll just see the room because it's oh. set up as a webinar. So we've we've got three questions already. In. And then I have one too. Oh, yeah, well, actually, well, yeah, I, I, it's lots of <laughs> so, so, shall we start? Actually, I think the easiest thing to do. It, it must be said also. Um, right, it's showing me. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> we were probably the better <laughs> slides, to be honest. Um, the, the poor people at home are now. <laughs> We're now seeing that. Um, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's there's, there we go. So there's the QA. So in fact, we can now, well, we can now see them up there as well. So um and, and the, the first, I think the other thing is we will take the questions from the QA. So people at home put questions in the QA. I am not going to ask for hands up and for people to unmute themselves and things because we had to share this on Zoom, sorry, sorry, on Twitter. We had a couple of bots in earlier who were making a real pain about themselves and were being rather rude. So at the risk of not inviting a bot to speak publicly, can I ask people at home to use the Q&A function and I know it involves typing, but to type out your questions. Martin Lusebeck has been very busy typing, as we can see. Um, so, I mean, the, the first question there, as we can see at the top, is from Rahim. 
um, who says, in, and it's this given very early on, um, will this, or how will this affect lawyers in the UK? Would it affect their work only with the European clients who want to expand into the AI industry? So I think this is really about scope and reach of this work. Um, Post-Brexit, do I need to know this? <laughs> or any other UK lawyer? I think, I think the easy, easy answer is yes, um, because you could ask the same question for a US or for a Canadian lawyer, and the answer would be yes as well, in the same way as um, an American lawyer would have to know about GDPR. Uh, it's going to be exactly the same for the AI Act. If I had no clients, if, if, if I had these AI clients who said, I really don't care about the European Union, it's not a market that interests me, is it possible then to avoid the, or is it going to be like GDPR? Do you think this is going to be the global standard, so to speak? It's hard to say. I, it was, I mean, people were generally surprised um, just how influential GDPR became. Yeah. Um, and that it wasn't actually a hindrance on innovation or, or kind of the competitiveness of, of European products, but rather um, almost like a yeah, kind of like, 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 a, like a, a seal of quality. And uh, it's fair to assume that the same will happen with the AI Act. We don't know, of course, but I, I think it will be that way. Do you want to take a question from the room? I think we'll do a Zoom and room. It's the traditional well, way. If, if, if I may, as a, as a UK or once <laughs> qualified legal practitioner uh, post Brexit, I think it's absolutely essential for UK lawyers to understand in detail the Artificial Intelligence Act um, as it's finally, uh, when it finally comes into, um, into being, and then of course it'll come into effect sometime after. Um, and I say that because firstly, it seems it's possible, but it seems inconceivable that either UK or third, other third country actions in this, the artificial intelligence supply chain will not in some shape or form have products, services, processes, systems um, in the market in the European Union. Um, it's very easy to see AI as a, I, dare I say, washing machine. Um, I had a question on that. I do see, I absolutely see where you're coming from. But of course, it is, Maddie made the point, there are many components in a washing machine as there are in AI. And so somewhere in the world, there will be players within supply chains that feed into AI systems and processes that are put into the market in the EU. Now, um, a client has the choice of going to um, a, a range of lawyers within the European Union who are, you know, who are jurisdictionally qualified. I think we find in practice that, that UK lawyers remain um, very close to European Union law, uh, obviously for in the past tense, because it's still part uh, of UK law um, and looking forward because we realize that we are part of a continental Europe. Um, and even if there are jurisdictional differences, um, our clients are going to need to understand what the, re what the requirements are within the EU. So I think, I think it, is, it, it is a measure that everyone uh, who uh, is in legal practice in the area, in the UK, uh, certainly needs to, to know about. And I hope that answers the question. Um, can I also add to that? Um, Please, as, as, um, as things stand right now, uh, a lot of the standards that are enacted in the EU are automatically inherited. Right. Uh, so, to the UK. so that's yeah. a, another thing to keep in mind. Uh, so they will affect UK lawyers, definitely. Julia. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. And, and thanks for, for, for the talk. This was... Um, so detailed, but at the same time, uh, I would say to the point to give us a sense of a whole, the whole process. And I think it, it was very, very helpful. Um, I have so many questions, but I would just pick perhaps uh, two or, or three, depending on <laughs> how generous is the chair with me. Uh, so uh, the first question that I have is uh, whether there is any, uh, any regulation or whether there are any rules that establish who should be involved uh, in uh, feeding uh, into these committees. So is this a choice that is taken by the committees or are there any rules on this? 
Um, and are there also any requirements as to how identify those that should be involved uh, in, in, this, in this field? Because I think that um, the committees are really a hybrid figure now applying legal um, um, uh, categories. It's a hybrid figure between a public and a private body, it seems to me. So I wonder to what extent then the public interest shapes also um, the participants to these, to these committees. Um, then second question, I was uh, very interested in, in um, understanding a bit more on um, how, who structures the top down and bottom up analysis. So are there, is there any guidance here in this context? Who decides um, what kind of items should be decided? Because it seems to me that this ultimately also shapes the, the content of, of, of standards. Um, uh, so there is a lot of um, a power in, in, this, uh, in this respect. Final, very final um, point. Um, um, I saw that one of the uh, suggested and um, proposed ways to go about standardization is to use a system similar to that of food labels, right? So uh, the intermediate option that, that, that you presented. And um, I saw that uh, one of the items was justice, how to measure justice. So if you can share some thoughts on this, uh, that would be great. Thank you so much. And, and I stop here. I, I could continue, but, but I'll just stop here. Thank you so much. OK, the, the first two questions are relatively straightforward. The third one is very interesting. Um, <laughs> not so straightforward. OK, so um, on the uh, composition of the committees, um, the rules of standardization bodies just state all relevant stakeholders mm, and it's up to exactly, yeah. the management team so the mm. chair and the secretariat of the committee to decide or to conclude what relevant means mm. in the given, given topic um then there is and there's the the annex three um set of organizations that sort of gives a hint on yeah. who, sh who should mm. be involved beyond beyond industry um it's usually not so much an issue of uh, you know, finding the right people or identifying the right organizations. Uh, and it's, it's also very rare that uh, well, it's, it's, it's unheard of that an organization is actively excluded. Mm -hmm. So if an organization raises their hand and say, right, we're, we want to send an expert into the standardization effort because we think what we do is relevant, they, they, they just join. It's, mm -hmm. they, they, it's, it's, I, I'm not, not aware of any examples where someone would say, no, you're not allowed to join. Usually people are quite happy for any helping pair of hands. It's, it's more to do with lack of resources. Um, and I know that there's been some critical commentary by uh, Michael Beal um, last year, uh, who's uh, um, analyzed the Draft AI Act, and in the same way also analyzed the standardization around it. Uh, he's, he's raised a number, and you might have recognized some similarities to my final slide, but I do not share his um, most serious concerns, which, which almost, to my mind, almost veer towards kind of a conspiracy myth that there is some secret cabal of people stitching up standardization committees. That's not the case. Um, it's actually a fairly open process, and uh, the limitations are because different organizations have got different resources to throw into it. And that's the fundamental unfairness implicit in it. Mm -hmm. um, second, second question, the, um, the processes inside, uh, some of them are very strictly defined in the mm -hmm. standardization body regulations, how you set up a new work item, what needs to go to balloting, what can be decided in a plenary meeting, how long before documents have to be distributed, commenting periods, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is also quite a bit of scope for the groups to structure themselves. Ultimately, it's also, it's again um, kind of uh, dependent on what people put their time into. If the standardization work item is approved and no one does the work, then it's it's still not happening. Third question on uh, justice. I um, follow up to that third question. Yeah. Well, as, as many <laughs> would know, because is it impossible with certain some AI systems to even have different types of fairness within one system that they will clash you can't even do you know what i'm trying yeah, to say yeah. so so it's not it's not there, there, there can't be um abstract completely generic definition of fairness or justice 
Um, and in, in fact, I mean, in that particular example, there's been that you know, debate whether to call it justice or fairness. And there were many pros and cons, which I'm not going to go into. Um, I think fairness is the more common term that is, that, that is being used. Um, to some extent, it's in the eye of the beholder. To, to another extent, it depends on the, um, uh, on the application. Um, and, uh, but it generally includes criteria such as representativeness. Um, it includes uh, the, the way that uh, training data is generated. Uh, or the, the, the kind of broadness of the spectrum of training data, but it can also include um, certain processes in the organization. So do they even have, um, for example, did, did they do some sort of stakeholder engagement to, to try and figure out what is fair in that, in that specific context? So uh, I've, I've actually involved in a, in a project last year. Um, I, can, I can send you some of the, the results there uh, to try and drill down fairness in, through a layer of criteria, a layer of indicators, and a layer of observables, more or less a tree structure to try and come up with something that is, that is quite, quite, quite tangible. So I can, I can send it to you. Uh, question there first, and then we'll to you. Um, thank you. I missed the sort of counsel just a bit here. So I did my undergrad degree in statistics and machine learning. So all this concept is very refreshing and also very new to me. So my first question is which type of AI system are subjected to this type of regulation? I understand that obviously it's a system for like job applications obviously falls under this regulation. But suppose I work for a media agency that deploys recommendation algorithm to audience, which can be subjected to nudging, that that's subject to like the AI Act. Also like for ride hailing applications, the matching algorithm between the riders and the passengers, is that what we define AI as well? And my second question sort of follows um, the question you would ask, like how to measure some of the standards. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what is the exact form of uh, reinforcing the standard, is it like ticking boxes? So whether they have this committee to do that, or it's like more complicated, you know, like more um, more matters in terms of how to calculate these metrics. Okay. Um, uh, first question on the on, on, on the uh, scope. The draft AI Act follows the OECD definition of AI to uh, set the general scope of what it actually refers to. And that, that, that is hard because it's, it's very hard to draw a boundary there. But then um, beyond that, the AI Act doesn't try to define AI, it just defines different applications and the sensitivity of different applications. And uh, it, it doesn't, so it, so it is fairly technology agnostic and a lot of it could also be used if you wanted to for some really complex software systems that have the same characteristics of AI. Um, uh, for all practical purposes, a black box that you can't really thoroughly test. You don't know what's what, what's inside, at least in practical terms, um, and uh, you, you 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 can't really assess how they behave uh, over the longer term while while, while in use while in operation, um, and uh, so 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 the 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 path that the uh, the European Union is taken by regulating the application and not the technology. I think it's a very sensible one and kind of works around that issue. Um, I'm just reminded of the second part of the question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, um, it's like a follow up on how to mirror AI. For example, do you ah, take okay. certain boxes or uh, um, is it some other uh, system? For example, you don't look at the code, you just look at the end result, like whether the result is like accurate and does not discriminate or do some, do the organization have to hand out their product design or the code for review? Um, there, was, there was an early attempt by the uh, high level expert group set up by the European Commission to try and come up with a test catalogue that was um, ridiculously easy to circumvent, let's put it that way. So it said things like, um, have you considered whether your uh, AI system might discriminate uh, certain vulnerable groups? And I could say, if I take that seriously, yeah, I've considered. I don't. I don't care. Uh, it's, of course, it is a criminal. I don't care. I can still tick that box. So, so that that was that was not done in a in a very good way. Um, 
more thorough assessments have to go beyond this box ticking very, very clearly, and uh, it's, it's it's going to be a, a much much more involved um, process, which might be the topic for another seminar. <laughs> My question is also related to the the rating system for AI. So, like, are these metrics going to be mathematical formulas, or are they going to be, you know, the principles as such? So, yeah. I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm happy to send around uh, mm -hmm. another piece of mm -hmm. work from from last year where, where we try to build a consensus around that. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah. So where we are now is 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 we are. So just to say, and also for those at home, we are now we're now coming up against our 7.30 deadline. There's still a few questions on Zoom as well. And I do understand that people may need to drop off or people may need to leave. But if the, if the speakers are happy to, to take a, a few more minutes, yeah. we, can, we can address some of these. Um, there's a speaker, there, there are questions from interesting people. So we've got Chris Marsden on Zoom, who I, I know very well. Chris and I go back years. Chris is currently a professor in Sussex, but is moving to Australia, apparently, maybe the weather is better there, I don't know what it is, or maybe their AI regulation is better, I don't know which. Uh, so, so Chris works a lot, he works in AI as well, but he works a lot in net neutrality. And, and he's got this sort of question about European values and, and essentially what do we mean by European values? There have been a few issues with Etsy and net neutrality standards, which is what he deals with. Deutsche Telekom, as an example, he doesn't mean them specifically, simply blocks any discussion that affects their business model of PU services. It's the same not likely to happen for AI. And he points out again, you can see it in the chat, that, that what Michael Veal, he's saying, was suggesting is that we get engineers who are discussing kind of engineers' corporate outcomes. Um, he's also adding more things to the chat anyway. <laughs> Uh, and, and essentially what SSO has become is a kind of coalition of the willing. So is there a danger here that the European values are the European values of the people in the room um, and not the European values of the people not in the room? And, and how can we stop that introspection, if you will? I think that's what Chris is meaning. And if I've got you wrong, Chris, I do apologise. Um, the <coughs> answer is yes and no. Um, yes, because as, as I mentioned earlier, we do see... Uh, large corporations blocking or, or, or at least delaying and obstructing or trying to water down uh, standards. And that happens in, in any kind of technology. Um, sometimes the motivation is that a global corporation just doesn't like European standards because it's a lot easier if the whole world uh, is, is the same from a, from a, a standardization perspective. Uh, and sometimes there are commercial interests against it. So, so we do see that. However, the European Commission has been wise enough to build a little safeguard into the Draft AI Act. Um, and that's sort of a plan B. Uh, it's a, it's, it doesn't really stand out. I think it's Article 40 or 41. That talks about common specifications. And that, what that essentially means is the EU says, well, dear, dear standardization committees, if you can't manage to come up with standards in time for the AI Act taking, uh, uh, taking effect, sort of late 2024, early 25, we are going to write our own standards and make them compulsory. So and that, that's what common specifications means. So if the, if the free ESOs are unable to come up with consensus-based standards, the European Commission will just look around at what's out there or or can we use any of that and elevate it to, to a status of a harmonized standard? Or, or can, can we just try and write our own? And then, of course, anything can happen. So my, my message to obstructive uh, stakeholders is, well, you can't obstruct here. But the risk is that we don't have consensus and the European Commission is going to write their own thing. And then you have no input at all. Um, and that's sort of... That, that, that penny has started to drop quite a bit over the past uh, six or nine months. So if we can crave a little more of your time. Um, we have, unfortunately, one, one of our fantastic colleagues, um, Martin Husovec, um, who is um, stuck at home. He should have been here tonight, but he's um, 
is stuck with the deaded positive line on mm -hmm. the lateral flow test, which is a shame. So um, from the comfort of his own home, Martin asks the kind of question I think lots of us are thinking this is a normative question. This is the long one. This is the washing machine one. Yes. The technical standards typically specify static requirements for the design of products, i.e. how to safely design a washing machine. Can we really use it to regulate the dynamic process of the use of software tools embodying AI? And can that be delegated to standards uh, organizations? We surely wouldn't outsource the decision making about whether different electricity power appliances can be used in particular settings to an SDO, either, I, e.g., whether a washing machine can be used after 10 p.m. to minimize the noise to neighbors, uh, what we might call ethical use of washing machines. If we expect some guidance at all, then we'd be probably expected from the legislature rather than from a bunch of firms. So, a, a firm challenge from Martin saying, what are you guys doing in this space kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that raises lot, lots, lots of really, really good points. Um, so, um, so, so, so th thanks, Martin, for, for um, this, this, this uh, very fruitful question, let's put it that way. So first of all, uh, with regards to the uh, dynamic process, um, <laughs> even old technology like a washing machine or a, or a lift uh, or, or, or any other, other piece of machinery degrades over time in use. And uh, hence, we have things like taking our car to, to uh, be inspected every, every year or two, um, because there is an expectation that it'll rust away and it's no longer safe. And so, so it has to be reinspected and re re recertified. And uh, the difference with AI is that you might, might not be talking about a year, we might be talking about a minute. If it's a self-learning system, uh, it, it learns something weird and uh, it, it, might, it might just be doing something stupid afterwards. So. This means that uh, testing has to be automated, part one. And it also means that there has to be infrastructure for the test results to be, um, well, let's put it that way. It has to be impossible to keep the test results secret. So if a company realizes, oh, my AI system has gone out of bounds somehow, um, it mustn't be possible for them to just keep, keep quiet about it. That infrastructure, the automated tools for automated testing of AI systems and uh, an infrastructure for some kind of notary-like collection of results, that doesn't exist yet. The role of the SDOs is not to set up that infrastructure. Um, the role of the SDOs is just to specify what could such an infrastructure look like. Not even what should it look like, but what could it look like or what properties does it need to have and it, it would then be the job of um, typically testing houses like 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 the two organizations like the media test institute like decra like uh, sgs and others uh, to to come up with with implementations of, of those uh, of those standards um i am not sure i completely agree with the statements that we surely wouldn't outsource the decision making about important issues to an STO. In a way we do, um, for something like electrical safety we do. Um, whether a washing machine is electrically safe, that's not in regulation, that's all in standards. Whether it survives, as, as many explained earlier, a li liquid washing, um, detergent kind of spilling over the top and kind of running into the electronic insides of the machine is going to blow up the thing. Um, that, that is the domain of standards. Um, what is not the domain of, of standards, and that's where I, I kind of agree with, with um, Martin on what is ethical. So the standard says, this is how you measure the noise of a washing machine, and this is how you measure time. Um, but it doesn't really say whether a particular combination of noise and time is acceptable or not. That, that really is not, not the domain of standardization. And it's the same for AI. It doesn't really say, uh, it, the standard would, could say this is what is transparency in an AI system. Um, um, but it doesn't say under which circumstances a certain level of transparency is enough or not enough. Do we want one more question? Or do we want to, there's still a few people online. People are dropping off online, but that's we're past the time. We've still got about a dozen people. The question that actually was quite interesting came from a ton of, uh, by, by the way, Chris Marston has come back and said, of course, the, the backup that the Commission can write its own common specs also exists in the open internet regulation, of course. So he, <laughs> he's, he's, he's backed that back a little bit. That's the, the thing that was interesting was, was from an anonymous attendee, because you can send these questions in anonymously, 
With ratings of transparency and privacy, there might be different persona um, on the needs of transparency, different users, consumers, data scientists, legislators. How do we deal with all these different personalities? So standard setting is great for something which is standard, but the human use and the human application and the and the use of AI around humans also, you know, is, is very non-standard. <laughs> Good, 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 good question again. Um, the, the, the discussion uh, on transparency is actually quite broad. So it doesn't just refer to, can, can you somehow see the data that went into training an AI system, or can you somehow see the version of the algorithm? But it also includes criteria such as accessibility. So is, is this uh, information understandable um, to a layperson or to an AI expert or to a consumer or to a purchaser or whatever. Um, and it also includes uh, kind of different settings. So should that data only be available uh, in the context of a court case or in the, in the, in the, in the context uh, of, of, a of a regulator requesting the data, or should it be available to anyone who asks for it, or should it be automatically published um, and uh, that, that is all part of the criteria that fit under the, the uh, transparency umbrella. We do have a little bit of an issue with the aggregation. I mentioned earlier that it doesn't make sense to aggregate things like the transparency and a privacy rating, but of course here we aggregate within the transparency rating and uh, that's still an open question how much information to make available in terms of drilling down into how that transparency level B came, came to pass. We're, we're at the point where it's now, we're now 10 minutes over. There are still questions coming in. I was gonna say, we, we, we've, answered, we've answered that one. And Martin, Martin, you've, you've had one question. Um, so you don't get another one. Um, there is one that's just coming in. I don't know if we want to answer that one or just at this point, if you feel you would like to answer that. And that can be the last question, I think. So it's, it's what I'll say. You can read that. It's, so for those who can't, if anyone who can't read it, can we end up with de facto AI standards bypassing slow SDOs? There are examples here. What would be the implications? What happens if you guys are too slow? Yep. Again, very good question. Um, yes, I agree. There are many historical examples where de facto standards just emerge by the monopoly or near monopoly power of a given, of a given company. You could argue that uh, Google TensorFlow or Facebook's PyTorch is standard because, because lots of people use it, um, lots of people recognize it, and uh, it's, it's got a very, very broad um, presence in the market. So it, it is a de facto standard. Um, and uh, as we discussed earlier, the motivation for companies who have a de facto standard established to go along with an STO process is sort of limited, let's put it that way. Um, so, the thing that, that protects us, I think, to some extent in the AI world is the existence of the AI Act and the insistence that it's underpinned by, by um, standards. So that gives a huge boost uh, to standardization and makes sure that committees like JTC21 are taken really seriously, um, both on the part of the Commission, but also on the part of all the standardization stakeholders, many of which do come from uh, kind of monopolists. So, yeah. And um, I guess uh, to add to that, uh, related to that, is that there is also industries uh, or sub industries uh, that self, self standardize. So mm -hmm. um, you'll see this uh, in some parts of you know, aerospace where they've decided that you know, cost of failure is too great. So all it's the benefit of everyone to kind of self standardize. So well, automotive is another, another example. And that's, that's another kind of tussle inside the standardization world, whether you have horizontal or vertical standards, vertical being industry specific standards. And for AI, um, the goal is to make as many standards horizontal as possible, but then there will be, there will be a few vertical ones and there will also be a tug of war who gets to do the kind of the intersection between both. We've dealt with all the questions into this. Yeah. So it remains for us in the room and you at home again to thank Manny and Sebastian for 
not just for the original session, but for your patience and thoroughness, um, good humor in answering <laughs> such, a, such a wide range of, of detailed questions. Um, so I'd like the audience, please, to join me in a final round of applause. And 